Well, I want to thank Randy Harp and uh, President uh, Adrian for allowing me an opportunity to participate in this virtual conference. I mean, honestly, it's kind of weird, but we've all been through this and we're getting pretty used to it. So thank you for allowing me to bar be a part of this uh, virtual conference. You know, a family went out to the beach at Panama Beach City, Florida. And a couple of the boys were out in the water playing when all of a sudden they got caught in a riptide. All of a, they, they were out of control. All of a sudden, they couldn't swim. This tide was carrying them out. And so they began to scream and yell and call for their parents. And the mother heard them. And she immediately jumped in the water to go and rescue them while the people on the beach were saying to her, you can't go out there. You're going to get caught on the riptide too. You won't help them. But what's a mother to do? She couldn't stand by and watch her boys screaming as they got carried out into the ocean. And so she jumped into the water and went to them. And sure enough, she too got caught up in the riptide. And one by one, the other family members jumped in the water and did the same thing until they were all stuck, hopeless, and it was not a good future for them. Finally, the people on the beach began to notice. They heard the screams, they saw the splashing, and one man went out to go and try to help them, but he, he immediately came back and he told his wife, I, I can't go out there because I'm going to get stuck out there too. His wife immediately went into action. She began to conscript the people on the beach and she said, grab somebody's arm. You grab another person's arm. And before you knew it, there was a human chain of 80 people from the beach all the way out to where this family was. They grabbed a hold of the family and they brought them back in and they were rescued. It took a whole group of people to do this. You know, if there was ever a time that we needed the Baptist Bible Fellowship, it's now. Why is this important now? Because we have an entire world that is caught in the riptide of a pandemic and all kinds of confusion. People don't know what to do. We have got to do what we have been called to do from the very beginning, now more than ever. And we need to hold on to each other because we cannot do this by ourselves. If you were to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, 35 to 38, I love this passage. In fact, this passage was one that worked on me as I felt the call of God to go into missions. And it goes like this. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. You know, Jesus is building this human chain. And he says, you know what, my heart gets moved and I see the predicament of people. They're like sheep without a shepherd. But we need, we need to do something. And you, you need to join me in praying that there will be more laborers. We've got to extend that human chain as far as we can go and help as many as, as we can help. This was a pivotal moment in the history of Jesus and his disciples. He was really telling them, you know what, you've, you've watched me and you've seen what I do. I am now telling you, I want you to go and do and extend the reach of my mission. You know, this uh, year 2020 was one like we've never had before. Uh, I'll never forget when it, I heard the news that we were going to have to shut down our services in March. I, I couldn't believe that. I mean, here we have this deadly virus sweeping literally the world. Also, I remember the day when it dawned on me that we weren't getting back together in a week or two. In fact, we were not even going to have an Easter service in person. Cancel the helicopter egg drop, put up the candy. It is not going to happen. I mean, there was this incredible angst in me because... I was thinking, this just can't happen, that we don't get to celebrate Easter in church. 
This pandemic was all over the world. My family from the Philippines, they were telling me that the same thing was happening over there. You know, how do you do ministry when you can't have people come together? I mean, I don't remember a class in Bible college that told us how to do ministry, spread the gospel, build community when you can't come together. It was a new day. I remember we began to scramble because I looked at our live stream and it was pretty pitiful. And I have a great group of people around me. They were, they're awesome. They began to study and explore and we, we immediately put a plan into action to try to improve what we could offer because you know what? We couldn't just stop trying to reach people. We had to move forward. This was the command. We had to reach people no matter what it took. And thankfully, we were able to pull a plan together. You know, we were all exhilarated when we began noticing that even though we weren't meeting in person, we had thousands of people watching us. It's like all of a sudden, every preacher in the country became a tele-evangelist. And I was so impressed with the thousands of people that were watching our service online until we drilled down and I discovered that, oh, a three-second view counts? Wow, that was a little deflating. Nevertheless, we were doing what we could do. I remember speaking with Gary Wilson, our missions director, and in our conversation I said, you know, Gary, I think we, we gotta be really careful. I, I mean, I, I don't know, with the church shutting down, I don't know if we're gonna have any money, but we've gotta support our missionaries. I mean, we, even now we have 60 plus missionaries and, and projects that we support on a monthly basis. I said, we, we've gotta at least preserve our ability to help these missionaries uh, on a monthly basis. So we, we just can't entertain special offerings, special requests. It wasn't very long till we began to hear from our missionaries who were asking if we could help them. Because where they were, the people around them were going hungry and they needed money so they could go buy food and help the people because their jobs were gone and their salaries were gone. And they just said, this is a great opportunity for us to do the work of ministry and use this to reach people with the gospel. I met with Gary once again and I said, you know what, it doesn't make any sense. I don't know how we're going to do this, but you, you can't postpone feeding hungry people. So let's just give by faith. And we did. You know, the amazing thing is that this last year was a banner year for our mission giving. Uh, God truly provided. Turns out, uh, people didn't need to hear my wonderful pleas to give and support the ministry. Uh, they just gave out of a heart of commitment and faithfulness and concern. And it's like the Lord just guided them to do that. It was a beautiful thing. Um, this passage where Jesus tells his disciples, it's a plentiful harvest. Pray for more laborers. It gets expanded because if you move forward into Luke, in Luke chapter 2, he calls the 70 to go out. Once again, he's expanding. You've watched me do, now you go and do. These 12 had 70 more people added to them. Now, you know, these disciples, they weren't perfect guys. You know, I mean, we see a lot of failure in the group, and the New Testament is incredibly honest and authentic about just talking about their stories. I mean, Peter was overbearing. He was prone to say the wrong thing at the wrong time. He had a strong opinion, and he seemed to always be putting his foot in his mouth. I mean, one time, Peter says to Jesus, oh, we're not going to let you go to Jerusalem and be crucified. And Jesus' response was pretty strong. Get thee behind me, Satan. I'd say that would get your attention. That's a pretty serious rebuke. And the infighting and the jockeying for a position among the 12 is remarkable. Who would be the greatest? Who would have the prominent spot? Thomas, he was known for always asking questions. Simon hated tax collectors, and Matthew was a tax collector. I mean, the tension, even among the 12, was overflowing. But Jesus took these 12, and he sent them out, and then he added 70 to go with them. They didn't have seminary degrees. They were fishermen. They were tax collectors. 
but Jesus sent them. They also made mistakes along the way in ministry. Uh, one of the stories I find so interesting is when some of the disciples went through Samaria and they didn't get a warm or responsive reception from these people and they tell Jesus, Would you, let's call down fire from heaven and nuke this village. Jesus said, no, no, that's, that's not the way this works. I want you to go and do, I want you to preach the gospel and heal the sick and take care of sheep that have no shepherd. You know, when I think about how um, ordinary the disciples were, even as they were historically extraordinary, it kind of encourages me because um, who among us doesn't from time to time feel in inadequate? I mean, we're not perfect. We don't get everything right. We make mistakes. We say things we shouldn't say. I mean, we can sometimes feel pretty incompetent. And then there's this thought, well, I'm too young, or maybe now I'm too old, uh, or I'm not smart enough, or I don't have enough money or resources. How can we, how can we push this ministry forward to reach more people? Um, and, and Jesus just pretty much says, I, go. Go. You. Imperfect you. Under-resourced you. Do what you can, where you can, as much as you can, and bring people with you. Luke chapter 10 this is what Jesus, uh, this is the story of Jesus sending the 70. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them out two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. Then he said to them, the harvest is great, truly great, but the labors are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest and send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way, behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, or sandals, and greet no one along the way. And so Jesus, in this passage, sends out these 70 along with the 12. Now, I think that there's a few things here that are pretty interesting that we should take note of. Number one is, I mean, we're a fellowship uh, Jesus told this group, I want you to go two by two. I, I, don't, I don't want you to go all by yourself. I want you to go two by two. This fellowship was started because we realized, our founders realized that we needed each other. We need each other for encouragement. We need each other because together we do a whole lot more than we can ever do by ourselves. I mean, ordinary pastors serving ordinary people in ordinary churches. I mean, but serving together is the history of this fellowship. You know, the church I get to pastor, High Street, has been a part of this fellowship from the beginning. This church is 86 years old. And our church has a much richer history and experience of watching God at work because of Baptist Bible Fellowship, because we were part of those who sent out missionaries, because we support missionaries, because we send our very own out to be missionaries. You, you know what, why is this fellowship important now? Because it's always been important, and it is important now, especially in the riptide of this pandemic season that we're in. The heart of God is to care for people. Every single human being on the planet matters to God. The rich, the poor, the weak, the strong, the famous, the unknown, God's heart is for everyone. He says, I want you to go. Go to those sheep that need someone to tell them the message. One of the greatest things that we get to do is, as we pastor our churches, we provide a context for ordinary, ordinary people to reach out to other people, and we empower their work. And then, you know, we see God do some amazing things. Uh, one of my favorite stories is the story of the founder of thebibleproject.com. His name is Tim Mackey. He co-founded this uh, in 2014. It's, one of, it's a great resource for teaching, and uh, he makes short videos overviews of themes in the Bible and books in the Bible. I mean, his site has 1.2 million subscribers. His videos have been viewed 90 million times. You know how Tim Mackey came to Christ? 
Listen to his story. He says, when I was 19 years old, I was a year out of high school. I didn't have much going for me. I had barely gotten out of high school. I had no aspirations, maybe like art school, but no real direction. I lived in my parents' basement and had a super low-paying job, which means I was pretty much like your typical Portland male. I had a few years, I had for a few years in high school, started going to this church in, in the downtown area of Portland that had built a large indoor skate park warehouse in the back lot. And you could go and you could pay two bucks and skate the park. Uh, it was covered and in Portland, because it rains a lot, that was pretty important and a lot of people came out to skate the park. Hundreds of people would come and skate the park at night. You would skate for the first hour, and then you would, you would, they would shut the park down for 30 minutes, and during that 30 minutes, a volunteer would get up and share the gospel. They would tell the story of Jesus. To skate the rest of the night, you had to sit through the talk. So if you skipped the talk, they wouldn't let you go through the doors, and you'd have to come the next week and sit through the talk, and then you'd finally be able to skate again. So this was skate church. I had been going since I was 15. I had been going for a while and had, by this time, heard a lot of talks. I always sat in the back totally tuned out. When I was 19, a whole bunch of things uh, were going on in my life and they came together. And a guy uh, named Mike, who was a volunteer staff person at the skate church, took me out to lunch one afternoon before skate church. It was Wendy's on 82nd Street in Gleason, and because, because they had a dollar menu, Mike had some dirt on me from some of my friends at Skate Church, and he knew that I had a bunch of my good friends who were now taking a turn into the hard drug scene in Portland, and I was spending a lot of time with them. That was a whole scene, and I was on the verge of getting wrapped up into that, and he knew that, and so in a loving, caring way, he took me out and brought me to a dollar, the Wendy's because they had a dollar uh, menu. And so um, here we were, face to face, and he began to talk to me. Not as a jerk, but in a loving way, he said, dude, what are you doing with your life? You're going to ruin your life. How many gospel presentations have you sat through? You, you know the gospel, you need to follow Jesus. And I, I don't know what to say. If you were sitting in Wendy's, that Wendy's that night, there were no clouds that opened. There were no trumpets. It was just stained Coke on the carpet, cheap for Micah Vineyard tables, greasy smell of Wendy's, and the kingdom came crashing into my heart and my mind as I sat at Wendy's. And my sin and the ways I'd lied to people and hurt people, all of it came crashing down in front of me. And the kingdom judged me, but at the same time, God's grace and forgiveness and the idea that I could be different, kind of a different kind of human, all became real to me at the same time. The kingdom saved me. So a few weeks later, Mike invites me to give the gospel at Skate Church. So it was my first sermon for over 100 skateboarders in a warehouse, and I bombed. It was like the most horrible talk I have ever given. And so begins the random, bizarre career of your friendly neighborhood pastor. I didn't ask for it. It just happened to me. The kingdom of God. You know... When we in our churches provide environments for ordinary people to talk to ordinary people and share the extraordinary message of the gospel, things change. Now, there's just a couple things I want to point out in this passage in Luke. They were instructed to go two by two, two by two, not by ourselves. In the fellowship is an expression of this two by two idea. One of my favorite things to eat for breakfast is uh, instant grits. I love it. You pop them in the microwave, and in a minute, you've you've got this wonderful bowl of grits. Um, <clears throat> one guy from some northern states heard about grits, and he'd never really tried them or even seen them. And he took a trip down south, and he was curious about grits. And so when he saw them on the menu. Uh, he, he told the, wait, the, the, the person waiting on them, um, you know, I, I don't know if I'm going to like grits, so I don't want like a whole order of grits. Can I just have one grit to try? And the waitress answered him, honey, 
They don't come by themselves. Now in the church of Jesus, we don't go by ourselves. We go together. That's the way Jesus wanted it. You know, Jesus didn't call experts. He called people. He didn't call CEOs or MBAs or managers or leaders, just laborers. And everyone qualifies. And they were sent out two by two. You know, they also um, were told, don't carry a money bag or a knapsack or even extra sandals. You know, there is this tendency sometimes to be so prepared to keep preparing and preparing that we never go. Many of you know that my family went to the Philippines when I was six years old. As a six-year-old, I got on a ship and sailed 21 days from San Francisco to Manila, and my family's life was changed forever. I mean, this was before long-distance phone calling was very much available, and it was too expensive to use. Telegrams were the you know, that was the communication of the day. And I remember asking my dad, I says, Dad, how in the world did you ever raise enough support where you would be comfortable taking a family of five 21 days across the Pacific to Manila and think you could survive? And he said, well, you know what? I was getting between $300 and $700 a month support And honestly, we just went by faith. There were so many unknowns, but we knew we just needed to go. You know, that's the story of missionaries in this fellowship. You just go. You trust. That's the story of churches in this fellowship. You just go start a church. You don't know what's going to happen. You just go and you trust. There is this phrase also, don't greet anyone along the way. Now at first glance that looks like a pretty unfriendly instruction. I mean, I tell our team we've gotta be friendly because if people don't feel welcomed and they don't experience the spirit of hospitality, they're not gonna come back. They won't relax enough to even listen. But that's not what Jesus was talking about. You know, in, in that area of the world, if someone invited you into their home, I mean, that was going to take a while because hospitality was so important. I mean, I remember being on a mission trip uh, in western China and uh, with a group of pastors and missionaries, and we, we found our way to this grass hut on the side of a mountain in China, and we met this family, and um, there was a dirt floor, a fire pit in the middle, uh, and then uh, they invited us to have lunch with them, and so that was great only understanding a few things, especially through the translator who was with us, uh, I didn't know what all was going to happen, but I knew it wasn't going to be a quick lunch when after 30 minutes somebody arrived with a burlap bag that was moving. There was a live pig inside that bag, and they were just now going to butcher that pig and start preparing it. We were there for a couple of hours. You know what? That was important. We were on mission But Jesus' message here is, don't get so distracted. There's a lot of things that could delay you. I don't want you to get delayed. I want you to stay focused. Just go. In the middle of this season of ministry, we are called to just go. People need to hear the gospel of Jesus they need a relationship with the God who created them. And we get to tell them. So in the middle of this uh, pandemic time, missionaries are still going to the field when they can. Some are not allowed back in because of, of the COVID restrictions. But we still are having missionaries prepare to go. You know, uh, just this last weekend, Um, We have been helping to start a church in Wichita, which is like such a wonderful thing. In the middle of all of this, somebody starting a church. Uh, In fact, it is the son-in-law and daughter of our BBFI president, T. 
Tim Adrian, Chase and Rachel Hill, last Sunday, launched the first service in a church they are planting in Wichita. And Gary and Lisa Wilson, our missions director, went to be there for the launch. And they sent pictures back. I looked at those pictures and I thought, wow, thank God people are still going. Thank God Chase and Rachel continued with the call and took the step to launch a church in uncertain times. And honestly, when I see a picture of a church that has just started, I think once again about the fact that I get to pastor a church that was started almost 86 years ago in Springfield, Missouri. And you never know what God is going to do when a church gets planted. Planting churches, sending missionaries, encouraging each other in this fellowship has been why we exist. And if there was ever a time that we needed to do this, it's now. Why is this important now? Well, first, because it's always been important, and secondly, because when things get tricky and confusing and uncertain, we need each other even more. May God bless the Baptist Bible Fellowship and our efforts together. I want to thank uh, President Adrian and our executive leaders the state fellowship leaders, the missions director, the director of communications, and all of the people that work day after day, those who lead our Bible colleges and teach our students. It's still happening. We haven't stopped. We're going to keep on going. And I want to just end by praying that God will bless us in this season. Join me. God, I want to thank you that you are a God so big and so powerful. You knew this was coming. Nothing surprises you. In fact, this pandemic is going to be your servant to further the, the reaching of people all over the world. As people feel the insecurity of death because of this, as they feel the insecurity of not feeling like they can be in control, Lord, I, I think many people are turning to you. We want to pray that you would bless our efforts individually, and collectively, may we keep the gospel being pushed out to the ends of the, of the earth. We, we do this in obedience to your command to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.